Okay, good evening all. Well, it's great to have everyone online. Hannes, uh, great to have you online. I'm going to hand over to you and uh, for another exciting series of Let's Talk Property. Thank you, uh, Scott, and good, no uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk uh, property tonight, and uh, I'm going to ask Scott a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Scott, perhaps before we begin, why don't you give us a an overview of why property and why did you start with property and specifically international property. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, I mean basically from my side, I've, I've always loved property. I was I was lucky with property early on. I studied property at uh, at university and I started, I bought my first South African property when I was 20 and my first London property when I was 23. And I did what most young South Africans do, which is study in South Africa or what most young South Africans would like to do, which was study in South Africa and then I went over and I lived in London. And I basically, because I was earning pounds over there, started to buy property back home in South Africa. And then because I was living in London, I bought a property in, in London. And I just became fascinated with international property because a lot of us always think that we have to buy a property in the same suburb that we come from. And I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, that was maybe the case because we only had access to information. The estate agents in the area were the only ones who, who had the local information. But with the advent of the Internet and everything that's possible now, it gives us the flexibility to really be able to look, maybe not at the moment across the entire globe, but I think that's coming. And, and that was really where the, the fascination and everything came from. And then, you know, I... Um, I met you in 2003. I'd been on multiple property courses all over the UK, and I, I went on your course, and, and it really it sparked an interest in me because it really it sat well with me in terms of understanding the growth, managing the risk, and the thing that I found fascinating when I learned the principles that you were teaching people in South Africa is that they were universal principles that they worked no matter which country you looked at, and I found it very interesting even with your property pro course how I could use it and and uh, to actually to track and analyze properties in different countries, basically. So, you know, it wasn't just a South African thing. Property, if you understand the rules and everything, is the same across the whole world. But obviously, there's a lot more risks that people need to understand when they invest outside their country. And that's really where, where I specialized. You know what, uh, Scott, there's something that fascinates me. I mean, most people at the age of 20, 21, uh, the last thing, at least on my mind, and 21 and 20 was, was property. So. Why a property at such an early age? That's a tough one. Um, I suppose, I mean, look, I studied construction management. So at the end of the day, I did my first uh, development as a student when we were 19 years old in Cape Town. And uh, it wasn't actually our property. We, we I persuaded the landlord to allow me to uh, convert a, a triple garage into two bedrooms, two bathrooms, so that... I already had five friends living in the house, but my mate and I decided if we put our entire year's, uh, we both had bursaries, our entire year's savings for bursaries, whatever you call it, into this property, we persuaded them that we could live rent-free if we did the development. <laughs> and uh, that was actually my first development that we did. I need to say I learned a very hard lesson because we didn't get planning, and so after the year we had to rip it all down because uh, the Cape Town City Council came down pretty hard on us. But um, yeah, so it was just a fascination. and. I think the beauty of, of working in London and being able to pay off my, my student debt pretty quickly, I then wanted to, to get involved in investing and start, uh, start buying property, which is what, what, what a friend and I did. Well, I think now with hindsight, if you look back, uh, that was one of the better decisions that you've ever made. And definitely, if someone really understands property uh, from an investment point of view, uh, that gives you a kind of growth that very few other properties are going to or other uh, investment vehicles will be able to give you. But you know, uh, Scott, um, let's um, uh, carry on. And I can tell you, um, uh, you've sent me your presentation, and uh, I was flabbergasted to see how much uh, time and effort you've put into this. So I'm not going to, uh, I want you to, to do the presentation. So let's start with the first thing. You say uh, the five most dangerous trends facing South Africa citizens today. Can you uh, tell us why do you say that and, 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 and what are those trends? I just want to, I mean, thanks very much, Hannes. I just want to, to start with the preface that I'm not a negative South African by any measure. I'm one of the most passionate South Africans you'll ever meet. Um, but I do consider myself an international person. And by that perspective, 
I do believe that one has to just be aware of what's going on in one's country. And I'm also a very big believer that one can't, one can't just invest all one's eggs in one basket necessarily. And, and I don't believe that's just because of political risk or anything. If you ask someone that invested all their, their money in Las Vegas property, you know, for the last 20 years, they wouldn't be feeling very clever right now. So I, it's just something that's always fascinated me. But, but these, are, these are five trends that I believe as a South African that, that are very important. And funny enough, I went to a talk by Clem Sunter at the end of last year, and I think if I remember rightly, um, did you attend that with me, Anas? No, I did not. not. Anyway, Clem Sunter is one, one of the more famous speakers here in South Africa on strategy and scenario planning. And he, he had a similar analogy. He actually spoke about when you go swimming at the beach. And he, he's been doing scenario planning for Anglo-American for the last 30 years for South Africa. And he said, you know, when you go swimming at the beach, if you're swimming and the normal flags are out, then that's fine. You keep swimming. If suddenly a red flag comes out, well, you know there's some danger and you need to be aware of it. And if a black flag comes out, well, then it's a shock and you better go out the water pretty quickly. Otherwise, you're going to get eaten. And... He pretty much came up with, with his four flags, and, and I just want to make people aware of, of what's happening. So these, these are the five trends that I think are, are very important. Firstly, we live in an extremely high-stress environment. Secondly, we have political and economic instability. Thirdly, we have currency devaluation. Fourthly, we have a challenge against wealth preservation. And fifthly, and one of the ones that I think is most important, is that a lot of South Africans do try and do something about it and invest overseas, and statistically more than 80% of people that invest in see overseas actually lose money. Now again, with every positive, there's a negative. Sorry, Hannes. Uh, the stats that you that you that you show us, uh, where did you get that? Is that the real estate web? Yep, that was from real estate 2010. web in 2010. Yep, last year. Okay. So just just to, you know, a matter of interest. I'm also a big believer that wherever there's a positive, there's a negative. So yes, we have political and economic instability in South Africa, but because of that, there's also massive opportunity. So what I what I want to to stipulate right up front, and and there's a lot of questions that people have asked, and and for those of you who are online, I will make sure that we go through them afterwards if we haven't covered them fully. But my belief is that there's real opportunity in South Africa, and if if someone really wants to make money. Then, then there's no better opportunity other than, you know, in South Africa. We're an emerging market, and it really it doesn't make sense to me when someone wants to go invest overseas, go and invest in, in an Argentina or a Cyprus or a Mauritius or, you know, one of the Malta or one of these other emerging markets where there's as much risk as there is in South Africa, but they don't know how to manage that risk. So my philosophy with investing overseas is that, one needs to look at first world countries where not, you're not necessarily going to get as high a growth as you can get in South Africa, but it will also work against some of these some of these long term trends. So let me just show you what I mean. Again, some research from the Financial Mail in April last year: three out of four adults in South Africa are concerned about their future because of political and economic instability, and 96% of South Africans will not have enough money when they retire. So we live in a high stress environment, something that's constantly hanging over us. And the uncertainty on one hand is fantastic because it makes us far better entrepreneurs, far better businessmen, and even far better employees because we get stuff done. But on the other hand, it, it's this constant niggling in the back of our in our back of our mind as to, you know, what what is the future hold. And and at the end of the day, you know, in terms of the crime statistics, I'm not here to talk about crime, but it does affect us. It, it's something that, that sits over us and, and that's really I believe in terms of, you know, leads to the high stress that we live under. The second one is the one-party state. Um, we've had uh, some positive things recently with the local elections, but at the end of the day, we, we still have a one-party state with the DA trying to trying to become a second force there. Julius Malema and the Malema factor. I've come up with a word recently called Malema proofing, which is a bit of fun. The xenophobia, which happened a year or two ago. The infrastructure problems, which we're dealing with again now, unfortunately. One of the ones that really concerns me is, is I'm a big uh, believer in education of our children, and we all know that there's massive problems with, uh, with maths and science. But I heard some, some horrifying statistics yesterday from my mother that runs a charity, and we constantly hear about how the pass rate goes up from 65 to 66 percent. But I'm not sure if you're aware that 70 percent of children in South Africa never make it to matric, which you know, is, is really concerning. And then, you know, the corruption and, and Kasadi versus capitalism. So I'm not, again, here to, to bring it up. We know a lot of the stuff is, is true. 
I follow Twitter and interestingly enough my good friend Julius Malema put up this post today, competition tribunal approval of Walmart mass mart deal with current conditions a slap in South Africa's face. You know, it really bothers me because I'm a big believer in, in the world going global and the advantages of international investment and, and uh, our good friend believes it's a slap in our face if we get international investment into our country. The third one that, that I believe is, is absolutely critical and, and something we all need to be aware of is the devaluation. And if you look at the economic fundamentals, over the last 10 years our average inflation has been 9%. We're currently sitting at about 6.5%. We're doubles between 5 and 6.5 at the moment. Australia, as an example, just to compare another country, you're looking at inflation of about 6% on average, now around 3%. So there's generally a, a gap of between 3 to 5%. Now, basic economic principles that I learned at Varsity, if one currency is devaluing at a quicker rate than another currency, it will affect the, the sorry, if one currency's inflation is at a different rate to another one. It's economic fact that over time, it will have to devalue. I also believe that it's not just economics, there's also politics involved, and we've learned this. I mean, the OECD came out recently and said the RAND is overvalued and it's hampering growth. Zuma said we need to consider what is best for the country. Kasatu and the exporters are, are screaming and they want to decrease the RAND. We all know what happened with George Soros when he shorted the RAND in 2001, 2002 when we went out to 20 Rand to the pound and 13 and 14 Rand to the US dollar. But the thing that's most important to me is that whether you take the economic influences or the political influences, the research that I did a year ago is that 90% of middle and upper income people in Zimbabwe, Argentina and Russia were directly affected financially by currency fluctuations. And the only 10% that weren't affected were those that actually had some of their income and some of their assets in offshore first world currencies that weren't determined by the fluctuations with regards to the currency. So it's something that's very interesting. Now, just to put all those facts and figures into numbers, and the graphs actually look very similar. I've got them for the UK if people want to send them to me. But this is research I did at the end of last year. And if you invested the exact same amount of money in Australia in 1978 versus South Africa, so the exact same amount of money in South Africa, and this is based on the APSA housing index and the Australian housing index. You'll see now that today your, your money, 28, uh, sorry, 32 years later, would be worth about a million rand net asset value here in South Africa. If you're in Australia, taking into account what's happened with the exchange rates, inflation and property price growth, you would have about three and a half million rand. So you'd literally be... Uh, Scott, yeah? can I quickly interrupt you there? One yeah. should be very careful for direct comparisons like that. Uh, I understand where you're going and it makes 100% sense, but uh, that is only capital growth that they take into consideration versus the rent. Uh, there's a lot more to property than just uh, this graph that's in front of us. But I understand where you're going, so, um, but if there are serious property investors, uh, they know how to invest in property and that you can't take only one factor into consideration and, and do a direct comparison. Uh, but it gives me a clear picture of, of, of that there's definitely a, a problem in terms of um, if you put all your eggs in, in one basket, uh, as an example, uh, per, let's call it 100,000 or per million, uh, yeah. definitely. Look, Especially if you do not know the rules of, of, of the game and how to invest. Look, there's no doubt in my mind, Hannes. Look, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to give people an indication of trends. You well know that if you took one great property in one country versus a property in another country, it could show you a completely different scenario. But if you're taking long-term trends, it is important to take into account. And I will actually show you a graph a little bit later where I've taken um, some other variables just to, just to show what, what that shows up with regards to a trend. Okay, fabulous. The, the other one that's important is that I've been following these guys um, with regards to their, they've got a RAND overview. They, they've been going since 2002, and anyone that's interested, I can send you the details. And I get graphical information on what's happening with the RAND to the US dollar. And they do it literally daily, weekly, monthly, um, yearly, and then they've got a five-year forecast. And I've been following them. Now, literally since 2002, when they started, they've had an accuracy of greater than 80% which is fairly good with regards to currency because we all know how difficult it is to, to analyze. When one takes the five-year view, I think the thing that's very interesting is that when you take this view, the only thing they're not sure of is whether the rand is going to be 11 rand to the US dollar or 22 rand to the US dollar. 
They're not too concerned in which direction it's going in. They're just not 100% sure where it's going to end up in the next five years. And I think that's something that's very, very important for all of us to take into account. Because at the end of the day, we want to be seen as global citizens, and we want our money to be able to buy us what, what we want, or you know, whether it's investment, fun, holiday, whatever it is, worldwide. And, and it's something that we need to be very careful of with regards to that trend. The fourth one, which is very worrying to me, and I think one that concerns me most because a lot of people aren't even aware that this is taking place, but we all know how important land and land ownership is in our country. Literally since the 5th century, it's been one of the most important things for men all over the world. And the biggest problem that we've had in our country is that in the 20th century, it became such a problem with because of the restrictions and everything that happened during apartheid, but it actually started long before apartheid. Now, what actually happened when we had the Constitution and when they wrote the Constitution from 92 to 94, the land was actually the biggest element which was debated more than anything else. It caused more of the emotion and it has more political emotion than anything else. Now, don't get me wrong, I 100% believe that we've got to do something about it because in 1994, when, when the new government took over, 95% of, uh, of the land was actually owned by only 5% of the population. The problem is though, is that what happened in Zim is that the government chose to literally expropriate land and not pay people back for it. And what we agreed in the Constitution was that it would definitely be government's policy that they were going to buy the land and that they were then going to, to transfer it into, into the formerly disadvantaged people. The problem is, is that there's been extremely slow delivery in that because of service delivery, because of lack of skills, and, and that is now being blamed on the landowners saying that they are not. So there's now a lot of talk and, and what they're doing, and this actually comes just for anyone, again, can send you all the information, but it comes from the Center for Constitutional Rights as to what is actually happening. Now you can see there's a lot of text on the screen, and I'm just over, I'm giving you an overview as to what is, what is important. But the most important things that have happened, the first indicator of this change was that they released the government's draft of the Agri-BEE framework, which dramatically increased the targets for distribution of black economic empowerment. The second indicator came with the release of a report by a government appointed commission into the issue of foreign ownership, which completely negates the government policy on foreign investment. And the third problem was the, the basically the draft policy document, which is where they want to amend the expropriation bill. Now some things that are important in here. Basically with regards to the expropriation bill, it's supposed to be so that if you're building a highway or, or something that's in the interest of the country, then they can expropriate, but they still have to pay you fair value, and it's still got to go through the constitutional court. What they're looking to change is, is what I've written in red here, the right to lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair administrative action limps in a weak third. So basically, they can expropriate your land, and then they will discuss how much they're going to pay for you. Commences with identification of the land for redistribution, followed by a notice of expropriation, after which the expropriating authorities take ownership and possession of the property. It is only after the transfer of the property that the question of compensation is considered. Now this is a dramatic change from where we actually are as to what is actually happening within the country and where the constitution is. And, and it's really, really concerning because we know where that left us. And if we look at the consequences, and again, this is directly from the Center for Constitutional Rights, the first major consequence that we will have is that the constitutional burden of bearing the cost of land reform will be moved from the state to the individual landowners. Secondly, it will negatively impact on the property market as a whole, as no one would want to invest in property which is subject to arbitrary expropriation with less, less than market-related compensation. Thirdly, it will threaten the state of the agricultural industry as neither emerging farmers nor existing farmers would have access to funds without the security of their collateral, namely the land. Fourthly, it will undermine the cooperation between the agricultural sector and the government. And we can understand how important this is. And funny enough, last year, if I stand to be corrected, but the statistics that I read was the very first year that we actually had to import some staple foods. And, and we became a net importer of food versus a net exporter of what, what we've been for many, many years. And lastly, it will undermine investor confidence, both local and international, with dire economic consequences. Now, I think we don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand what influence this had with regards to Zimbabwe and how quickly things changed in Zimbabwe 
once people lost confidence in, in what was happening with regards to the land. So this lady, Nikki de Havilland, who's an advocate at the Center for Constitutional Rights, has put this whole document together. And as I said to you, I'm quite happy to send it through to you. And she is basically outlining what the major problems are. Now, this is draft policy. This is currently sitting in Parliament that they're going about. And a lot of us are actually not sure and not aware of what's happening. The second thing that I think is important with regards to this land, and if you don't mind, I'm going to pay you a little video clip. And this, again, is from my good friend Julius Malema. Now, he, he literally mentioned this two or three weeks ago at the ANC Lewis League conference. Now, some people will call Julius Malema, Malema a buffoon, and some people will think he's very intelligent. I personally... I just believe that what I've learned in life, and I actually learned this with the global financial crisis, unfortunately to my detriment, and Hannes, I, I should have listened better to you here, but you know, the, the, the wise investors were saying there's problems, there's problems, there's problems on the way. And, but, but everyone else was saying, no, it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. And I've learned in life that where there's smoke, there's fire. So I'm again not being, um, I don't want to, to, to be you know, massively dramatic about this. But I think it's important to know what he's got to say and what he thinks. And I also think the one thing that's very important, and this is slightly conspiracy theory, but my uncle, I'm ex-Zimbabwean, just so you understand where I come from, and we've, we've still technically got three farms in Zim. My uncle left Zim in 2003 and now lives in Brisbane. And he said to me that in the late 90s, there was a gentleman that was a very loud mouth in Zimbabwe, and he constantly used to shout his mouth off, and then he would get wrapped over the knuckles. But he wouldn't nothing dramatic would ever happen to him and he would constantly do it and and my uncle is adamant that it was a strategy to to have the sort of the the frog in the hot water so that when they come along and and do something it's not as bad as it sounded five years ago and so we're used to it so let's just listen quickly to what julius had to say three weeks ago with regards to land in this country and the first one deals with the expropriation without compensation. Uh, we're talking about the taking over of the land by the state without compensation. And we're saying this should be done through the introduction of laws and legislations which will give the democratic state powers to do so. Now, this uh, taking over of the land without compensation is informed by the fact that when they took over our land, those who are owning it, it today, they never gave anybody compensation. And therefore, it would be incorrect to want to demand that uh, they must get uh, anything from us. The other issues is that uh, we have no enough money to buy this land from this people. And uh, if we take the little money we have and go and buy the land, we run a risk of failing very important service delivery issues like uh, free quality education, healthcare, housing, electricity, sanitation, and water. We are here trying to address a problem that was created for us by the colonizer. And therefore, we cannot be persuaded otherwise uh, because we feel very strong that uh, we need to reverse this uh, crisis caused by the colonizer. Now, we all agree that those who have taken the land from us are now part of us and therefore it is important to share equally with them. Uh, and our taking over of the land does not mean other people will not have an opportunity to own uh, the land. But uh, we are simply saying the land should be shared uh, equally. Uh, we think that uh, this rule can happen within uh, the South African constitutional uh, framework because uh, we respect the rule of law 
and uh, will also feel very strong that it must happen through listening to the people. It must not just be some policy that comes from nowhere and then imposed on the people. We must take it to the people and the people must uh, make inputs. Uh, but also, when we say constitutional framework, we know what the constitution says now. And therefore, that's why we seek to amend the section 25, uh, which encourages a, a compensation. Uh, and therefore, we think that through the majority we are commanding in parliament and through listening to many people in South Africa, this amendment can be uh, taken through. It, it will be incorrect for anybody to say we cannot amend the constitution because in the constitution there is a section that deals with amendment and that section cannot just be there without being utilized. It is there for a purpose and amongst other purposes is to deal with the matter uh, in question. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not being a doom monger. If you want to call him a, a buffoon, you want to call him a genius. At the end of the day, I just want you to be aware of the conversations and what's happening out there because I think the biggest thing that I've learned from wealth creators and from intelligent investors and sophisticated investors is that they analyze their risks and they know what is out there. The fifth one for me is that 80% of people lose their money when investing overseas. Now, I've analyzed this extensively. I've dealt with a lot of high net worth people. I've discussed what they've invested in and I'm not just talking property. I'm talking about shares, property funds, etc. The most important reason why people lose money is that they make crisis investments. Just like my mother in 2001 when the rand slipped to 20 rand to the pound, she panicked and took the savings that she had and, and sent it overseas at 19 or 20 rand to the pound. And just, you know, just like her, many other people did the same. The other thing that people do is that they jump on airplanes, they fly over to London or Sydney or somewhere else in the world and they give themselves one week to buy an investment because they say, right, I'm going over to buy an investment. And I always say to you, with all due respect, if you were from Cape Town, or even if you were from Pretoria, and you drove down to Johannesburg and you gave yourself one week to find a good investment in a, in a market that you don't really understand, your gut feel doesn't work, what would be the chance of getting and making a good investment? So that's why the first one, that they, the reason that they lose money is because of crisis investments. The second one is they don't get the right information. So <coughs> they rely very heavily on the people providing the information. Invariably, those people have a an ulterior agenda and because they don't have the right information they they used to getting the right information in South Africa they used to dealing with their gut feel they've got the right networks and connections they've got a trusted circle of people that they rely on and they don't have that in the overseas markets and because of that they make the wrong the wrong mistakes and that brings us on to the third one which is the wrong partners you know at the end of the day very often they, people are dealing with, with estate agents and, and people that don't specialize in international property and most importantly, try and specialize in multiple markets, which is actually impossible. You know, wherever you deal, and I'm sure, Hannes, you've got this, wherever you deal, even in, in specialized markets, different, different suburbs, it's always best to deal with a best of breed partner who, who knows that market, understands that market, knows the risks, knows the, the growth opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, do, do you deal with best of breed partners, Hannes? Absolutely. Uh, if you want to to go into serious, serious problems, you start making use of people that, that do not know, especially the wealth creators way of doing things. And you can run seriously into to problems very, very quickly uh, by picking the wrong partner. So I'm 100% in agreement with you there. I mean, the, the, the next one is, after you've got the partners, is that people don't understand the cash flows and the management. They often get sold by a, by a good salesman up front and they get very excited, but they don't understand all the costs that are involved and particularly with the after sales and the, and the management side, it, it can be really extensive. It's very different in most countries to the way it works in South Africa and that's often where people really burn their fingers. They get told lovely stories like in Dubai where they're going to get 15% uh, yields and the challenge is, is that all, that all the developers done is pack that into the price and pays them back over the next two years. It's not market related at all and then what happens after the two years is that their yield drops from 15% to 5% and their cash flow goes out the window and they've got a major, major problem. The, the, the next one is working with companies without local and international offices. 
you know, I, I deal with people all the time that come and see me and, and they're trying to find an estate agent or a company that flies over from Australia, meets them in a hotel, they sign the papers, it all sounds hell of a good, they look at pictures and plans that are, that are pinned up on a wall and then, you know, two weeks later that person's gone, they've paid their money and they can't get hold of them. And I'm, I'm a big believer that you've got to deal with established companies and, you know, my, I always joke with my clients, but you can come and beat me with a baseball bat because I'm in South Africa and I think it's very, very important. But you've also got to have, come, you've got to deal with companies who've got, you know, offices on the ground in those countries because there's absolutely no ways that you can be successful unless you're constantly monitoring on almost a daily basis what's going on in the markets. And then, as I said to you, the last one is underestimating the after sales and the costs, the legal fees, the finance fees, and everything else that's involved in it. And again, a lot of the time when it comes to international property, people are not told about these up front. They unfortunately learn them the hard way. So, Hannes, that, that really, for me, is the five fundamental dangerous trends that we need to be aware of. Now, whether one people want to take action or, or not, that's fine but I just want them to be aware of, of what those trends are and, and certainly it's something that they need to keep in their focus and in their direction. Yeah, Scott, uh, first of all, I must thank you for bringing that to our attention. As wealth creators, you, you know, we're sitting and one of the major things that we need to manage the whole time is risk and there are different ways that one can look at risk. Uh, risk is not only uh, from a capital point of view that you can lose your capital, uh, but there are other factors to take into consideration and uh, I must applaud you for what you've done here and the uh, amount of time and effort that you've put into to it to bring it to us and I think it's something that we all should really take into consideration because uh, if you build your whole portfolio for example in property and for some reason or the other um, when you need it it's not yours anymore it can cause havoc uh, but I can also tell you that um, Julius um, he's, he's barking up uh, a tree that perhaps he should not bark on uh, at and uh, I can clearly uh, heard from his that he hasn't got his facts straight but uh, that said uh, that does not mean that it's definitely not a threat or a possible threat especially in the future and especially if you look and, and start looking at the energy levels of the masses, uh, then the wrong moves at the wrong time can can have serious, serious effects um, on us. So um, it's interesting, um, there are so many different ways that one can invest, uh, Scott, so perhaps why on earth um, uh, property and why property, why even compare it to, to overseas from an investment point of view, but because from a wealth creator's point of view, I'm only interested in one thing and that is What's the growth on my investment? Of course, taking risk into consideration the whole time. So why, why property? Well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, and, and a, a number of people have actually seen this slide before, but just to bring it up, because I think it's important, you know, this comes from Barclays Capital and takes the last 10 years. So it takes from 2000 to 2010. And at the end of the, you know, after 10 years, it's, we've had a stock market boom and bust. We've had a property market boom and bust. And it actually took, what Parkley's Capital did is they took their high net worth individuals and they took all the assets that they've invested in and they looked at the returns. You can see there on the left-hand side that gold had the best return at 323%, then oil, then fine wine, then property. Now, you can see right down the bottom there that the stock market is at minus 14%. And I've put the figures on the right-hand side. The one thing that's also important is the way they did this property over here, that's ungeared property. So depending on what you want to gear it at, the returns will be different. Now, granted, this is a this is a total annual return over the 10 years. And I think, you know, one of the best things, it's always easiest to invest with hindsight. But I think also very importantly is that long-term property has, has always been a stable investment. And I think also if you're investing offshore and you don't have your finger on the pulse on a constant basis, it's a lot easier to invest in a, in a more... Um, in an asset-like property than, say, shares, where they're so volatile they can change on a daily basis. So we tend to find a lot of people that want to invest offshore for some of the reasons we've spoken about, where they're trying to create wealth preservation, they're trying to have peace of mind, they're trying to have a plan B. We tend to find that property can basically provide them with that in terms of what they're looking for. But as you well know, Hannes, and, and what you teach people is that it's also the type of property so that they can get far better returns than what these averages are. Yeah, and I think also another thing that we need to take into consideration the moment that the media or 
the financial institutions start punting something, you know. Uh, ten years ago, uh, unless you had a vested right in selling a gold, uh, you would not really uh, tell people to invest in gold. Uh, with hindsight, it's very easy to, to, to say, but I should have done that. Uh, also, um, the financial institutions got this policy divers diversify and uh, don't put more than, for example, 10% into gold, uh, which is a lot of nonsense, but in any case, they, they want uh, people to believe that you have to diversify. But uh, an, another interesting uh, thing, Scott, if you take 323%, uh, it sounds great, but if you break it down, you're going to find that the 323% is equivalent of approximately uh, 15 to 15.5% 15 compounded growth. So uh, one should be very careful when you start dealing with financial institutions and with stats not to be carried away and to think, flip, 300% sounds great, but uh, they use different terminologies uh, to confuse us. And um, if, you, if you understand a property as such, you know that there are 27 different variables that, that you can use as part of leverage. Of course, there's risk as well as growth uh, that's linked to that. But you can really, really, by, by doing a little bit of homework uh, in South Africa or anywhere else in the world, you can, uh, that geared 436 uh, percent that you've got there, you can, you can take literally that thing into the thousands on condition that you've got the skill and the programs and the systems and the backing and the uh, people around you that can help you to, to get there. No, very much so. Look, there's a question that's come through here from Brendan. He says, is this measurement only capital growth because gold doesn't pay rent? Yeah, uh, it, it, it certainly is, basically. It's, um, it's, although they do say here returns after inflation and including income, but at the end of the day, it will mainly be based on, on capital because, of, as, you, uh, you know, as you rightly said, gold in terms of where you're looking at. But I think also, just to show you and, and to answer a question, <coughs> a lot of people ask me what's better between local and offshore property. So just this is just a high-level overview where I just look at it. Firstly, in terms of the returns locally, you get higher returns than you do offshore. It's a it's a merging market. There's better growth opportunities here. You understand the risks, and as Hannes just said, if you've got the skills and know how to manage those risks, you can get much much higher returns. Property tougher, so it's it's a lot easier to buy property in South Africa. You understand the market. You've got the context. You know how to make you know take access. Offshore, it's a lot more difficult. You know, again, it's a new set of skills that you need to look, and a new set of partners and information. Peace of mind. Well, again, this is this is uh, for everyone's own opinion. For me, you know, my, my properties in, in South Africa are certainly a lot less peace of mind than, than my properties overseas. Again, my personal opinion, this, this stuff is not, uh, it's, it's, it's opinionated, but this is what I think. Financial planning for my family. In South Africa, yes, I do believe it, it's, but, but I also put in there maybe because just in terms of my plan B, I personally like to have um, a, per, a portion of my in, income and my assets overseas. And that's where I said offshore is from a financial planning. In terms of a rand hedge, locally, no. Offshore, yes. And diversification, no. And offshore, yes. So just running through here quickly, in terms of where we're looking at, some of the advantages I see in terms of international property. Firstly is wealth preservation. So I always say to someone, if they, they come to me and they say to me, Scott, I can get a far better growth by buying a building in Johannesburg than I can in Sydney. I say, look, I completely agree with you. I don't dispute it at all. I believe that if you're looking to invest overseas, you should never have a minimum of less than five years, and you should be doing it for certain key objectives. And one of them is wealth preservation. A second one is a rand hedge. Again, don't try and I'm not clever. I'm not going to sit and try and tell you to invest, you know, take your money over now, whether the rand's going to get weaker or stronger in the short term. I'm looking at long-term trends. That's why I try to show you that graph over 32 years. I believe it's very important to, to have first world income and first world assets. And at the end of the day, with the way the world's going from a global perspective, with internet businesses and globalization with regards to businesses, it's not just a property thing. A lot of people are now looking to be able to provide themselves with that. From a tax perspective, we don't have time tonight to go into the tax, but if you know what you're doing, you can actually set it up and be tax efficient. Um, so you can set it up all legally and be tax efficient both in South Africa and in your foreign country. In terms of a credit rating, particularly for those people that are thinking maybe one day they might move to Australia or England because their children live there, it's a hell of a powerful to set up a credit rating, and I'll explain that a little bit later. 
diversification pretty much explains itself. And as I said to you, you know, there's a lot of investors. Actually, the number one investor in American property outside of Americans is actually Australians, just as a matter of interest. So it's not a new thing for people to be investing internationally, and it's not just because we've got you know political or economic challenges. It's becoming more and more of a trend for people to invest internationally and take advantage of different markets. And then certainly peace of mind. I certainly know a lot of people I've dealt with that, that invest overseas like to know that they've got that peace of mind, that even if Julius has absolutely no influence or significance, when they hear him sprouting his mouth off and saying things that they don't like, they've got that peace of mind that they've got a plan B in, in action. And interestingly enough, on this, this graph to the right-hand side, I did a very similar analysis from, again, 1978 to 2010, and this took into account rental yields in both South Africa and Australia. And again, although the graph is slightly different, you can see the trend is, is fairly similar. And, and again, it's, I understand there's 27 different variables, but I'm just trying to show you a trend as to what happens when you compare the averages across the different countries. All right. The last three things for me are the Plan B insurance policy. As I said, I've, I've come up with that word, mal malema proofing, um, which is just my own fun little way to describe it. But um, possible immigration options. I'm very, very cautious. A lot of people always ask me, well, if I buy a property, can I get a passport? Please be very, very careful. Those countries that offer passports, there's always strings attached. In America at the moment, they've been giving away uh, passports, green cards, if you go and spend 500,000 US dollars cash. But you're investing in an area which statistically across the entire country in America, 300 different metropolitan regions, the area that they're offering the green cards in is the worst affected area in the whole of America. So everything comes at a price. And don't kid yourself, if you're buying a property to get a passport, then see it as just that. You know, you're not trying, you're not making a good investment in property. Whereas if you invest correctly internationally and you buy the, you, you build up the right type of assets and the right type of income, then you become, in my opinion, an international citizen and you can immigrate should you want to at the later stage. And lastly, comparable returns in first world economy. That's, that for me is, is, is very important when you're investing. You want to be looking for returns that over the long term would be comparable to what you would be able to achieve here in South Africa. Right. Um, Scott, the, the next question basically then is going to be, when on earth uh, do you invest? Because you've mentioned it that you take a long-term view. At the same time, you've said that in South Africa you can get a far better, let's call it a return, especially if you know what you're doing and, and how to do it, and you've perhaps got a, a system to help you in achieving that. So, um, and, and because properties, uh, you take a long-term uh, standpoint, uh, what would you say from your point of view, why invest and when uh, should you invest uh, in overseas property? Okay, look, I think, I think it's something I learned from you, Hannes, years ago when I did my course with you in 2003. The very first thing I would say is that you, you mustn't get caught up in, in what's, you know, necessarily what's happening in the markets and everything else. It actually comes down to the individual investment that's going to suit you and what your key objectives are. And, I mean, you taught me that in terms of analyzing the investments and not getting caught up in all the hype and what's going on. But I think what is important if you took a broad-based view and why I would would I, why I would look at it, and for those of you who know Ian Fife, unfortunately he passed away at the end of last year. He was the editor of the Financial Mail, and him and I were constantly having this debate, when is the right time? And, and you know, at the end of the day, there's never a right time except for in hindsight because when the RAND is, is not that strong, property prices, you know, were, 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 it, was, it was good to buy, but, but, but the RAND was weak. And, and then the RAND, was, uh, the RAND was strong, but property prices were, were, were weak, and, and you get these fluctuations. And that's where we've actually been for the last 18 months or so, where property prices were, were lower and the RAND was strong. So it became the, the perfect opportunity for us South Africans to actually take advantage of it. Now, just in terms of what I believe is that, again, I wouldn't personally rush out and do anything just because the RAND is strong. What I would do is I would take a strategic investment approach rather than the crisis management, which I explained earlier as to why 80% of people lose money. So you need to understand what your key objectives are. You need to come up with a game plan. You need to educate yourself. You need to get the right partners. And then in terms of a strategic investment, you need to follow a plan. But the nice thing is, is that if you take, you know, now, then you can control the variables. In five years' time, if you, or if you wait two years or you wait five years, 
you're not sure. That property might cost you X Rand now, but in two years the Rand might have devalued. You know, and, and those are variables that are out of your control. So, you know, the big thing is, particularly in the first world markets as well, they've taken a substantial knock over the last two years because of the global financial crisis, and there are good opportunities. And I've met and, and helped a number of South Africans who have access to capital, and they want to park their capital in a, in a safer environment, and that capital can then unlock opportunities. And the last thing is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Hannes, but, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were allowed to take out 500,000 Rand per person for our lifetime. And then it became a million, and then it became two million, but it was still for our lifetime per person. It's now four million rand, and that's per year per person. So you know, in, in your situation where you're married and you've got two children over the age of 18, you can actually take up to 16 million rand per year out of the country. And if you've got a company like you're a property company already, you can actually apply for your FDI, which is your foreign direct investment, and you can actually move up to 500 million rand. So, you know, the days of, of not being able to move money and stuff overseas have definitely changed, and that's a significant amount of money now that should people want to invest. And I drew this little graph on the right-hand side, and for me it's a bit of fun, but at the end of the day, on the left-hand side, you've got the RAND's purchasing power, and, and the bottom is the cost of investment. And the way I see it, if you take long-term trends, and I've been trying to show you those long-term trends, is that the RAND over the long term is going to continue to devalue like it has for the last 20 years, and on... In terms of the costs, they're going to be going up over the long term. And the way I see it, the longer one leaves it, the greater your problem actually becomes. Unless, of course, you know how to let your rants work for you, then you can uh, reverse that whole thing. But uh, there's other factors that we have to take into consideration as well. But I think we're going to run out of time. So, Scott, uh, the next question, basically, that I think that you can help us with, and again, it's from your point of view. I, I know that uh, everyone must take their own responsibility, but because you've got a little bit more exposure to this, um, a lot of people will come and say that you have to uh, spread and not put all your eggs in, in, in one basket. Your feeling about that? How much uh, should one invest uh, over short, uh, uh, offshore? Look, honest, I, I learned this actually off Clem Santa and it, it was a, an analogy. I went on this talk of his about two years ago, actually, and I thought he summed it up perfectly. Because there's no right and there's no wrong. You know, everyone has a different opinion on this. And he pretty much said to me, you know, what is your percentage happiness in the future of South Africa? So in my case, it's, say, 70 to 80%. I'm completely passionate, and I hope that I live here for multiple generations to come. But I'm, I'm about 70 to 80% convinced that, that there's, you know, we've got guaranteed a great future here. And so on that basis, I need to invest between 20 and 30% of my capital offshore. Now, I've got businessmen in Pretoria, as an example, who are 100% are concerned about the future and are literally moving 100% of their money overseas. If someone is 100% happy with South Africa, then don't invest anything overseas. But, but I think it just gives people a nice little metric upon which to work to try and analyze you know, what they should be doing with regards to their offshore investments. So again, it's basically emotional, and uh, secondly, uh, that can fluctuate depending on what Julius Malema says <laughs> and how he says it, and what the media brings to us. Uh, but uh, I like this, uh, Clem, uh, and uh, the way that you put it, because that is actually what one should do, because the emotional part really and truly plays a, a big role in any uh, decision that you're going to make, especially investments. Now, I'm telling my, my students the whole time, uh, get the emotional side out, but unfortunately it is impossible to take the emotional side out. And I think if uh, this little, let's call it a formula, if you, the happiness is 70%, like in your case, what you say, uh, and then you should consider taking 30% out. One of the things that I uh, want to add, perhaps, if you are thinking in terms of investing overseas. I, I think the, the sooner you start your investigation, like with anything else, because you're going to find that along the lines and along the way, you're going to get and you're going to run into uh, problems that you, that you haven't foreseen. Now, if you are pressed to, to sort out those problems and to get that information, uh, you're not going to get it because uh, the emotional side is going to overrule and overrun uh, everything. So, you have to prepare in well in advance, uh, if you plan, 
to take some of the money out and not do it uh, just because Julius Malema says something. And that basically brings me to the next question, and that is uh, who on earth do you then trust? And what do you look for when you start dealing with, uh, let's call it professionals and, and people overseas that is going to do it? Because there are so many, uh, let's call it potholes, that you can step into it. Uh, I remember when I was over in 2005, I think we've done a, a couple of presentations together uh, in 2000, it was 2005, Scott? Yeah, 2005, 2006, yeah. yeah. And at that point, in, in uh, I, I looked at the, the property market in the UK. Uh, luckily, my program told me what I wanted to know, and with hindsight, it's easy to say. But one of the major th reasons why I did not invest at that point in time, I wasn't sure about the management side and from an investment point of view uh, with the London market at, at that specific point. Plus, the program showed me that the properties there were was extremely, extremely overvalued. So, what who do you trust and what do you look for? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, Hannes, just, just from my own experience, this is these are some of the reasons, and I've, I've already mentioned a couple of them in terms of why people lose money, but, but in terms of who you trust, the, the problem is this, these are the, the, the mistakes that people make, wrong information, wrong areas, the purchase process, so they, they don't understand it and people lose their deposits. You know, there's countries like Spain and Dubai where you build and, and you basically make stage payments and, and literally the developer goes bust and, and you own a building without a roof on it. Uh, wrong valuations, pricing misinterpretations. I've heard so many stories where South Africans have paid for properties, you know, that are 30% more than if they were what they were sold to locals. Uh, wrong tenants or no tenants. Again, I've, I've explained countless stories of where people were promised that there was going to be a nurse's home in the area. I mean, in Manchester, as an example, there hundreds of South Africans have bought into a place called Salford, and it was supposed to be near Salford University. And I went up there. There were 2,000 units all built and coming online at a very similar time. And the sales pitch was, well, there's there's thousands of students and they want to live there. But the but the, these flats were actually 15 kilometres from the from the university. And anyone who's ever been a student knows that you want to live near campus and near the pub, basically. You don't want to be commuting 15 kilometers. And well, definitely closer to the pub than to the campus. But well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, the scary thing is those, those, those 2,000 units, they're standing empty. People can't give them away, let alone rent them. And because of that, the banks won't finance them. And it's just an absolute uh, abortion of a project. And it all came down to, to misinterpretation of where tenants and stuff would come from. And that then led to the next thing, which is cash flow problems. You've got maintenance problems, like you just said, if you don't have a management and maintenance solution, the wrong property for the market. Again, you've got to be very specific in different countries. Different properties are better than other properties. You know, And I think that's, again, there's no point in going into detail of every single country here. But one has to be very specific. Just because a gated community in South Africa might be good, it doesn't mean it will be good in, in Australia where they don't have crime, just as an example. And then a lot of people think that they're going to get in quickly and make a quick buck and sell. This certainly was a problem a couple of years ago when it was possible in South Africa. And, and it just doesn't work like that. If, you, if you're wanting to take a view of less than five years, then I always say, please don't even bother. And then lastly, no customer service. So just, to, just so that people can, can understand this, I've actually put together a report on the five things that you need to know. And what I've done in this report is I've, I've asked a whole lot of questions. Well, I've enabled you to ask a whole lot of questions. So no matter who you're dealing with, you can sit and you can ask them these questions. And, and it pretty much goes through the five most important things. The first one is information. And there's a whole lot of questions, but you need to ask things like, how much do you spend each year on research? So how much do you actually, that company, spend on researching the market? Choosing the right markets and the local investments. So you need to basically be able to, to help them uh, you need to understand from them how much money they spend on the research so that they understand the local investments, what's happening. A great question as an example is how often do you fly to that country? Now don't, don't, uh, don't give me hogwash and tell me it's a great investment, blah, blah, blah. How often have you flown over there? How often do you understand the market? Do you know what's going on, etc. In terms of the partners, co-investors, you, know, you, you ask them, well, have you invested before? Are, are you just a, a local estate agent who's good at selling houses in Johannesburg and now suddenly you've been given the opportunity to sell something in London? Or actually, are you an international professional who, who knows how to invest, basically, and have done it yourself? The rentals, you've got to ask you know, loads of questions and really get 
to the to the bottom as to where are the tenants going to come from? Where's that demand going to come from? You know, if you're investing in Dubai, and and I counted when I was in Dubai a couple of years ago, I counted that they had 37 buildings along Jamiroquai Beach, all about 50 stories, all the size of Michelangelo Tower, all coming along the line at the same time. And yet people were constantly investing, and I was like, well, where where are the tenants coming from? Where what is going to sustain this market? The local and international offices we've spoken about and the after sales we've spoken about. So I'm going to give you my details at the end of this webinar, but if you're interested, I can send you this report because I believe it's one of the most valuable items that you can use should you want to invest offshore. I agree with you, uh, Scott, and uh, simply these f five questions can help. One of the things that, that I was quite surprised to see, not only in America when we were there, but also in the UK and and in Australia is the amount of information that is available on property. I, I mean that that kind of research that you can do there, in comparison to South Africa. I mean, uh, South Africa has got uh, the stats uh, in terms of property. You, you can't even begin to compare it to to what's going on in in, in the Americas, uh, the UK, and in, in Australia. And uh, that to me was quite surprising because. I think from a risk management point of view, uh, that can help quite a lot, uh, especially if you've got a system to evaluate it with. Because uh, in Americas, we were there uh, three, four years ago, uh, and then a year, two years ago. And uh, at a certain point, I said to Tanya, to invest in America does not make any sense. And that was simply the property pro system. A year ago, I said to her, well, now things are looking totally different. We were in, in Vegas as an example, and Vegas perhaps is not one of the best examples that we can, can use. But property simply became uh, a lot, lot, uh, compared to what they sold like two or three years ago, uh, they were cheap. But you had to take into consideration what the rentals would be. And uh, because people need in certain areas, they, they still need to go and work and they still need to make a, a living. So even though they're selling their houses, uh, they still need a place. And suddenly the sums are making uh, a lot of sense. Uh, well, think, a year ago... To, to back you up there, I think what's, what's also very important though when it comes to that research is that there is so much research out there. But you've also, you've, it's, it's taken me 15 years to know which research you can rely on and which is, do you know what I mean, that you don't get an analysis no, paralysis because, I mean, if you want to go and search for, for stats and, and information on America, you can spend the rest of your life looking at information. So it's also knowing where to look to get the right type of research. Absolutely, and that is why the partners becomes, uh, especially overseas, uh, play such a vital role so that you know that they've done their work and that you can rely on them. But they, that basically, uh, you know, uh, I talk uh, of America and we talk uh, Dubai and uh, Australia and the UK. Uh, which countries do you think one should invest in from the research that you've done uh, up to now, uh, Scott, and, and why would you advise, uh, for example, those countries? Well, if you don't mind, Honest, I'm going to I'm I'm going to just uh, give you an overview of three countries. I'm not going to focus on Dubai. Um, I think we all understand what's happened there, and I think the biggest reason is because of supply and demand. And any country where there's massive oversupply, so mainly Dubai, Spain, America, um, Ireland, as as an example, Cyprus, that they, they've they've seen big problems with properties there because of the oversupply. But I'm going to focus on three countries, and that's because that's the biggest demand that I get from anyone you know, coming to me constantly, and that's America, the UK, and, and Australia. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to take you through some of the latest research. And, and this is not supposed to be an economics overview, but I just wanted to give you some of the things that are very important. And I, as I said to you, I've got all these market reports. If anyone wants me to, I can email them through to them, because um, I'm just going to bring out the highlighting points. Now, I went to America last year. I spent a month in America traveling all over the West Coast, the East Coast, and some of the internal places, including Vegas. And just as an example, very interesting enough, Hannes, you talk about property being good in, 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 uh, in America and, and even last year. I looked at property last year that was $320,000 in 2007, so it was a four-bedroom place in Las Vegas, that I could pick up for between eighty and 100000 And it was a serious motivation. But then I went and I asked... The taxi drivers, you know, what's happening in, in Vegas? I'm just giving you this as an example. And they actually said to me that 5,000 families a week were leaving Vegas because 60% of the 
the GDP of Barbados is, is tourism and, and gambling, and that, that was basically down so badly that everyone was leaving. And it just, something just... You know, surprised. you know, Squat, huh? it's, uh, I, <laughs> I basically asked the same question when I was in Vegas, uh, also to a taxi driver, and it's things like this that the average, let's call it investor, overlook, because you can get so much information from, from people that is so obvious, uh, uh, it's like a, a thermostat of what is going on in that specific country or that specific city. So <laughs> it's interesting that you that you mention that. But uh, okay, I've well, well I mean, it's just, it's, it's just fascinating for me, and, and very interesting enough. We've got a, a friend of ours that I met in Fiji last year when I was on a on a business course over there, and he's a he's a real estate guy in, in Vegas, and he's trying to sell us myself and a friend of mine. He's trying to get us to invest now. Do you know that those same properties are now going for forty thousand dollars? So yeah, I know. Uh, I could pick up a property that was in the market or valuated and and sold for two point. Uh, I think it was two point six million that were in the market at that point in time for three hundred and seventy five thousand. Now that is seriously, seriously tempting if you if you just look on in in terms of uh, the valuation. Uh, but the moment that you start looking at all the factors, like all 27 factors, then at that point in time I said to Tanya, there's no ways that I could buy this property because even at that price, it, it was not an investment. It, it sounded like an investment and it even looked like an investment, but it, it wasn't an investment. And now, like a year, year and a half later, I'm flipping glad that I've listened to my little program and did not invest uh, based on what I saw at that point in time. And again, that comes back to to, to, you need to have the skill sets, you need to have the system, and you need to have the people on board to tell you. Now, the problem that you're going to sit, the moment that you attend, and I did attend a couple of presentations where they sold property at that point in time in Vegas, totally, to totally uh, overinflated, but those people will never tell you the truth because they have to sell those properties, otherwise they're not going to make a living. So you need to step out of that, break that emotional uh, what you may call it that you that you've got, and 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 really step us, uh, back and and then start making decisions. You know. Well, I think I think this is important, and I mean this comes back to the partners. And it's again a personal story, and I, I do realize we we're getting on with time here, but I think these stories are important. I I went to a, a talk in Johannesburg, actually held at the Southern Sun Greyston, and it was a fantastic. Uh, it looked like a fantastic opportunity. It was in a place called Tampa, which is in Florida. Um, it's on the other side of Miami. For those of you who don't know, and um, it looked really good. It was blue collar workers. It was apartments that used to sell for 120 that were now going for 40. Um, they, they reckoned there was a huge rental demand and everything else. Anyway, long story short, I flew to Tampa because my belief with anything when, when I look to invest myself or help anyone else is that I need to know what's going on. And I went there. They put me in a car and to give it to you in South African um, terms, they picked me up in Johannesburg and they drove me to Port Shepston. Um, and by the time I got there, I nearly punched them their lights out, basically. They were so desperate to sell to me. They told me it was Tampa, but I'm not exaggerating when I say we drove from Joburg to Port Shepston. It was like eight or nine hours. And then we got to a place that was the size of Port Shepston. And then they tried to persuade me that it was a fantastic investment. And while the owner was off talking to someone else, I asked the sales agent and said they'd sold 20 out of 160 in the last, they hadn't sold one in the last nine months. And of that, only like 30 of them were actually rented out. And so literally, you know, they were just so desperate to sell to, to ignorant South Africans. And there were lots of people in that, in that Southern Sun Basin. There were more than, you know, 80 people at the presentation. And it just terrifies me and just shows you the type of lengths people will go to to try and, to try and move their product, you know. Mm. But, but before we, you know, I, I, I'm conscious of time here. So I just want to give you some headline elements with regards to America. And this is research that I literally pulled off today. House prices in February sank by 3.3% to just above the post-crisis lows of April 2009. So literally, they're still crawling along the bottom from the low from April 2009. Home values are now down 32% from the peak set in May 2006, according to SP Chiller, um, K. Schiller Index. Um, prices continue to weaken. Trends in sales and construction are disappointing. The drop has come in two stages. First, the index recorded 36 months of nearly uninterrupted declines after the spring of 2006, then came a 13-month upswing during which the index recorded a 5% gain. That re rebound ended last June. Since then, the index has recorded losses every month 
and is now edged closer to a new low, the dreaded double dip. Just as a matter of interest, it says here in Phoenix, properties have come off 56% off their peak, and they also go on to talk, and this is all from CNN Money, I can, I can send this information to you if you're interested, but economists say that the initial rebound was mainly due to artificially inflated by the government incentives and initiatives and what they did for tax credits, etc., etc. They also said here that uh, the foreclosure market, a lot of properties were held off the foreclosure market because of those tax incentives, and they're now coming back into the market, and more than 30% of sales actually account for discounted and, and repossessed properties, basically. There's a tremendous amount of pessimism about the economy, and most people are reluctant to make a commitment to buy homes. And they do go on to say that the more property prices devalue, the more it leads to more foreclosures, and that it basically becomes a vicious downward cycle, because people can't remortgage their properties, and then banks also don't want to lend further funding. A little bit of positive news is that the rents are mostly, have mostly been stagnant for the past few years, but expected to head higher as most people have been hit by the housing market have turned to renting. Rents could rise 7% over the next two years. They do say, again, that property is down by 32%, and they did mention here, which I found very interesting, that home ownership across the whole country has dropped to 66%, where it was as high as 69% two years ago. And that whole sort of dream that buying property is the, is the only way of the future, et cetera, et cetera, is changing in, by American standards. And lastly, Anders, just because you mentioned Vegas, I thought I'd mention it. Vegas, on average, is down 53%. And foreclosures in California and Arizona, 45% of sales in California and Arizona are foreclosures. And 28% of all existing homes during the first three months were sold as a foreclosure. So just to give people an, an example of what is actually happening, the last stat I wanted to give you here is there are 158,000 deals involving distressed properties nationwide in the first quarter, and that's less than half of nearly 350,000 during the same period for the last two years. But overall, there's 1.9 million distressed properties on the market. And I think the, the interesting thing was, as well, is that they say that it could take up to five years with this rate just to try and take up the slack. There could be up to as many as 10 million properties in America because of the shadow inventory. And the shadow inventory is the, the stock that the bank is holding back. So I just wanted to show you two graphs. This was a graph that I got last year when I was in America. This purple line here is what they, that is the subprime crisis. So basically it was people that were on reset mortgages. They were generally on two and three year fixed mortgages and then when they got to the end of the two-year and three-year fix, they, they were giving dinky loans, which is or, or ninja loans, basically, which is no income, no job, no assets to people. And I asked someone, I said, what did you have to do? And they said, you literally needed a heartbeat. And the problem was, is when these reset mortgages came through, this was the subprime prices. You can see it here, 2007, 2008. This line here that I'm showing you, that's Lehman Brothers going out of business. We currently, we were actually a little bit further. As I said, I got this last year. This light blue one, is the securitized commercial debt. So this is the commercial mortgages that tend to be on five-year fixes. And you can see the problems that are coming in the back end of 2011, 2012. Now again, I'm not being a doom member, but I think anyone that's involved in property needs to know what is happening in terms of this. Now the bank is trying to do something about it, but there's over $2 trillion worth of debt that's going to be coming up for review in the next two years. The second thing I wanted to show you was, was a stat that I got today. And this just shows you the house price growth over the last uh, eight or nine years. You can see the huge growth. You can see the peak around 2006. You can see the dip, dip around April 2009. And it's been bumping along the bottom. As we I explained to you, it's gone up by 5%, but we back down to where it was. So hopefully that just gives you an overview as to where we are with Australia. Now, let's look at England. Now, interesting enough, Hannes, you spoke a lot about the different uh, research. If you go to England, there's seven different indices, and you've got to be very careful which one you use. If you use Nationwide as an example, it's like looking at the ABSA housing index, because Nationwide is one of the biggest banks there. The problem is, is that less than 50% of property in England is actually mortgaged. And so the Nationwide is not reflective of the whole market. So I use a group called the, the, the Academa Metrics. It's actually the Financial Times Index. It's the best index of the seven because it's the most, it's the most thorough and it is actually taken off the, off the deeds office in terms of what's happening. 
Just to give you some headline things that are important, is that at the moment it's very hard to tell what's going on in the English market because they had a whole lot of holidays in April, so a lot of the April statistics are out. But I think the most important thing, if I was to show you and to discuss what has happened, they also changed their stamp duty holiday um, for properties over a million dollars. So in April they had a huge amount of properties. But the bottom line is when you look at England, there's a distinct difference between what's happening in England and what's happening in London. Property prices across the whole of England have continued to go down, but in London they and the southeast they're actually up. The National Institute quarterly review suggests that there will be a very slow recovery of normal prices over the next five years. It says that in real terms, taking into account inflation, there will be a 10% fall by 2016. Much turns on the assumptions made about inflation, but this does indicate how exposed the housing market is at present. The second thing it says here is that basically, as I said to you, properties, properties actually down across the rest of England and except for the southwest. Now I just wanted to show you the thing that I've always looked at, which I think is so important, is the number of housing transactions. Because the biggest problem you've got in America is that there's a massive oversupply of property, as I said to you, upwards of 10 million, anywhere between 4 and 10 million properties. The problem you've got in England is not an oversupply. There's more demand than there's supply in England, but they can't get access to finance. And you can see here in the boom years, there were the average transactions per month were over 120,000. The average over the last 10 years has actually been around 100,000 transactions per month. At the low in April of 2009, it was 26,000. Currently, we're sitting up here at around 45,000. So if you read the press, they'll tell you, well, transactions have actually doubled over the last two years. But you need to understand that they're still 55% off the long-term averages. And the reason for this is that interest rates are so low at the moment. I've got a property in London, a five-bedroom house in Wimbledon. The last year, my mortgage was £26 a month. I mean, it was an absolute joke. My DSTV, or my Sky, as they call it there, was £50 a month. And so even if I was on the dole, I would not be forced to sell. The challenge you've got on the other side of the equation is that people can't get access to finance. In 2007, there were over, there were over 2,000 different ways to borrow money as a first-time homeowner, and the average borrowing rate was around 5.5%. Today, there's less than 100 ways to borrow. You've got to put down a 20% deposit, and your borrowing rate is generally around 6%. So it's more expensive to, to borrow money, even though the base rate is at 0.5%. And with that huge deposit, you know, 20% deposit, and if you take the average house price in, in England is £222,000, so 20% of that is, call it £40,000, the average wage in England is £19,000. So they, they now believe that the first-time homeowner will generally be able to afford to buy their first house at the age of 38. And that is why these transactions are so low. Not because there's no demand, but because people can't get access to these properties. And then lastly, just to show you a comparable index as to what you saw with that American index, you can see all seven different indices. The one that I use is the, is the one in uh, the purple one at the top. You can see, but I think safely you can say that all seven indices are showing you the same thing. The properties last year, the, the London property market as an example, and the whole of the English market lost 15%, but then it recovered quite nicely last year. But again, has started to, you can see the decrease in, in price growth. And at the moment, it's, for the last couple of months, it's just literally been bumping along the bottom, as you can see from this graph. And then lastly, I spoke to you about two different markets, but you can see there the growth over the last three months, London and the southeast, completely different in terms of what's happening in the rest of the country. And I think one has to be very specific, like in South Africa or like anywhere. You can't just talk about a total market. You need to be specific as to where you're investing and what type of property you're investing. Lastly, Let's move on to Australia. There's a, there's a group there that I use called RP Data. They again are, are an independent body. They provide fantastic research. And again, I can send you the, the report. The most important research, and I picked this up, this literally came out today on the 31st of May, so this is as, as fresh as you can get. The luxury suburbs have dragged down the Australian market. The big thing with the Australian market, again, is that the demand far outweighs what rages the supply. The problem that they've got at the moment is that they've had eight interest rate hikes over the last 12 months. So in terms of the top end of the market, as that headline just said, that's where they've actually seen the problem. The near double-digit interest rate hike in November last year is bitten with seasonally adjusted Australian capital city dwellings down 1.2% in the last three months to the end of April, although in raw terms housing value is mostly unchanged. So basically the Australian market 
has slowed dramatically. It had huge growth. It was the only market not to go into negative growth after the global financial crisis, actually growing by 8.6%. But they did that because they acted very quickly. They dropped their interest rates from 8.75% to 3%, which was a 65% drop. And then when they realized that they, that they had started to get through the economic trouble, they started to lift their interest rates and they've lifted them now eight times by 0.25%. So they've lifted them to 5%. The average borrowing rate long term for Australia is between 7 and 8% and they're currently sitting at about 7%. So the long, the long story short with Australia is that the growth has slowed but the economic fundamentals are certainly in place. And this can also be seen by this graph again, just so you can compare apples with apples. And you can see here what has happened with the growth. Here you had the global financial crisis, and then they had great growth because they dropped interest rates so quickly, like you get in any other country. And then as they started to raise interest rates, you can see that it has started to decline. The big thing with Australia is that you've got to be very specific in what area you're investing, in what city you're investing, and also in what type of property, because you can see here the different types of properties, the different type of growth that you've had. And, and then lastly, you can see here by the different cities, also over the last 12 months, which cities have done better. Now, South Africa tends to be more, it tends to follow itself. You know, what's happening in Cape Town tends to be what's happening in Johannesburg or Pretoria, as an example. Australia is very, very regional. When Sydney's booming, Perth can be busting. When Perth is booming, Sydney can be busting. When Brisbane's doing really well, somewhere else can be doing. So you've got to have people on the ground to understand what's going on. And at the moment, when one looks at this, you've got to understand all the different elements as to what the best properties are to buy, which are the best areas to invest in. And you can see from this graph over the last 12 months, you know, where one should be investing. And just as a matter of interest, Perth has been the worst performing market for the last three years. It reached its peak in 2007, well before the global financial crisis and it was because of affordability. Brisbane, on the other hand, it's more expensive than, than, than Melbourne, and, and so it's had a slow growth, but the reason that it's had that decrease was because of the floods in January, and 20,000 homes were actually taken out of the market. So short term had a massive impact on the economy, but medium to long term, the supply side, they've lost 20,000 homes. But again, there's not enough time tonight to get into the essential details if, if one really wanted to understand each and every market, but I wanted to give you that overview in terms of what's happening. A graph which I put together myself just so that you could see an overview of all the countries and look at it very quickly if I was to compare, which was the question you asked me, Hannes, up front. Basically, if I was to compare Australia, the UK, and Australia, uh, sorry, Australia, the UK, and America, you can see there that the economy, Australia's had an economic shift to China and they're in a growth economy. The UK has just come out of a recession, but there's serious sovereign debt with regards to Europe and the troubles there. And America's in a growth phase, but massive structural problems. The debt, Australia has no debt. It went into the global financial crisis with, with $18 billion in surplus. They managed to spend that, but they didn't go into deficit. England, $910 billion. Every English kid that is born is born with £30,000 debt on their head. And the USA, according to the research I did today, is 14.3 trillion. Now that equates to 98% of their GDP, and the UK at 910 billion is 60% of their GDP. The GDP growth for 2011, according to the IMF, in Australia is 3.5, the UK is 2.5, and America is 2.6. The average long-term growth in Australia is 9%, the UK is 9%, and America there's 300 different metropolitan statistical areas. So in South Africa it would be Joburg, Pretoria, Cape Town. That would be an MSA. In America, there's 300. I can't find research for the entire American country. The growth of property in 2009 in Australia was 8.6. The UK was minus 15% and America was minus 40%. In 2010, it was 6.1% growth in Australia, 6.5% in, in the UK. Just remember there that London was actually 17%, so it actually recovered back to, its, to the highs of where it was, and America had no growth. And then just in terms of my gut feel, the risk and versus opportunity in Australia, it's Australia steady eddy. You know, I've got a I've got an extensive market report, a 35-page report from my last trip there, and the risk is average. I've gone into all the risks as to what will go, and I, I don't have time tonight to go into that. But the opportunity is also average. They've got a, a rule in Australia called FERB, which is Foreign Investment Review Board, and you're only allowed to invest in in new property in Australia. In in England, again, the risk is average, the opportunity is average. 
but again, I don't, I don't, when I invest in England, I don't consider anything outside of London worth investing in. I only look at London and, and I believe that that, because that's where the income is, that's where the demand for rental is. And then America, lastly, I believe that the risk is very high. I've, I've used a couple of personal examples. Hannes explained a couple of his personal examples. I think the risk is very high. I think the opportunity is great. I think if you can find a great opportunity on the ground, it, it, is, it is a good investment. But one has to be so careful there. I personally think the risk is too high to, to warrant the opportunity because of all the underlying variables and, and basically how desperate they are to, to sell their properties. So hopefully that sort of gives you an overview of the three different countries. I think the, the last thing I would say to you, Hannes, is to answer that question, is that there's no right and there's no wrong. It depends on, on different people's perspectives, what they're looking for. And what I always do is I need to understand personally what someone's looking to achieve before one can recommend which country is better or worse, because it's different for different people, if that makes sense. It makes sense, uh, Scott. And uh, one of the things that I just want to bring in uh, under the attention of of some of my students, one should be very careful looking at all the stats because it can conflict the hell out of you. At the end of the day, there are basically 27 different variables. You take the 27 different variables, and based on that, and uh, a 10-year moving average, you're going to get uh, something uh, or reasonable in terms of the risk as well as the growth, where you can make an informed decision. Uh, so don't don't. Uh, by now, I think my students know that I'm not, although I've done a master's in, in economics, uh, I do not pay a lot of attention because a lot of these things that I'm looking at, for example, the GDP, uh, I question those GDPs uh, just to start off with. There's no way, I've been in America now uh, for the last uh, four years, I think two, two times, uh, and I can tell you that their GDP is not 2.6%. There's no fucking ways that it's 2.6 percent, but they manipulate the the uh, trends or the the uh, the variables so that it suits them in order to project something that is better than what it's actually what it actually is. Uh, but that was on the sideline. Uh, next thing, uh, uh, Scott, um, you've you've been dealing with a hell of a lot of people over a period of time, and I assume that by now there are certain concerns and like we that they do presentations, you, you get the same concerns over and over and over. Uh, can you tell us some of the concerns that South Africans, specifically South Africans, has uh, when they want to invest uh, overseas? Yeah, perfect. I mean, look, I, I, as I said, I am conscious of time, so I'm going to run through this quickly. And just as an example, I'm just going to use Australia. There's different concerns in different countries, but I do believe that the concerns also overlap with regards to offshore investments. So the one that I get all the time is I want to go to Australia to choose the right investment, or I want to go to London, or I want to go to America, etc., etc. Now, what really worries me is that people say to us, say to me, they're going to go over for a week or two and buy a great investment. And we've spoken all night about doing the research. And just to give you an idea, what we do in Australia with our best of breed partners, we've actually got a 100-point rating system. It's a 10-layer filtering system. I've put it up here, and it looks at everything from population growth to employment growth to capital growth, and, and you can see all the different indices, what's happening there, what's happening with the infrastructure, the rental market. And I think this is very much in line with, with what you teach us, Hannes, in terms of you know, taking the emotion out of it and actually doing the research. And what we actually do is we put together this full statistical analysis on what's happening so that we can compare and understand where the best investments are with regards to, to each area in Australia. There's also, and Hannes mentioned this earlier, there's phenomenal research in first world countries in terms of what's happening in a city. So just as an example, I've put a map here on the screen of Melbourne. Now Melbourne, they used to call it Melbourne 5 million. They now call it Melbourne, sorry, they used to call it Melbourne 2030. They now call it Melbourne 5 million. This here, you can actually see the outer boundary. You know exactly where the city is, where they expect the growth to be, where they expect the, the growth nodes to be, where they're going to be putting the infrastructure, where they're going to be putting the schools. The one thing they do very differently in first world countries, and particularly in Australia, is that they build the schools, the roads, the shops before they build the houses. So not, not quite like South Africa where we build the houses and they realize we don't have roads, electricity, and water. But, and the thing is, if, you, if you've got access to this research, you would know in Melbourne that the greatest growth corridor is to the west here, to the north here, and down the southeastern block here. Now, if you're looking to invest 
and you literally just fly over to country, you're never going to have access to this information unless you know and have got the right partners. And this is what I mean by information. Here again is, is another thing with regards to Melbourne 5 million. You can actually see what their plan is over the next, literally from now until 2030, where they're going to grow, where they're going to put in all their urban growth boundaries, where they're going to put in all their roads, their rail, everything. Now, as an investor, you've got to admit that if you've got access to this information, it's not rocket science to work out where the population is going to grow, where the rental demand is going to be, where the demand in terms of capital growth is going to be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just wanted to give you an example of the type of information that's available. But people that just fly over don't have knowledge to this. And this is why and what you need. So that's the first one. The second one is I'm worried about management and maintenance of my investment property. It's so far away. What can I do if there are problems? I think the very important thing here is that I came from the philosophy, having bought properties from, from London in South Africa, the dealing internationally is very difficult. And this is a very valid concern. And for me, this management and maintenance is absolutely vital. And my belief is wherever we help people invest, we find best of breed partners that have management and maintenance solutions. So as an example, in Australia, our best of breed partner, they actually set up in 1987 and they, they were set up to help Defence Force people invest in property. So the guys in the Army, the Air Force and the Navy. So they were sitting in a boat in the Mediterranean. They also couldn't fix their, their uh, property. They couldn't you know, deal with management. So they provide a full management and maintenance solution. And many of their investors are not just in South Africa but all over Australia where they can't just pop over and fix the house. But whether it's in Australia, whether it's in England, whether it's in America or anywhere else for that matter, you've got to have that, that thorough management and maintenance solution. The third one is what happens if my tenants don't pay my rent? How can I afford my mortgage? Again, you've got to be very careful. Rental guarantees are vanilla. All they are is that the developer puts the price on top of the purchase price and when it runs out it might not be market related. You've got to be able to thoroughly and, uh, uh, um, do an analysis on this. Something that I found very interesting is that this company, Ozinvest, that we deal with in Australia, they came up with a 10-year leaseback guarantee. Now, this is not a rental guarantee. What they basically do is they become your tenant and they then sublet that property out. The way they do it, it's, it's a very unique concept. It's very simple, but they've got over a 1,000 units under management. They charge $18 a week. That's about $18,000, and basically that provides them with a kitty. So at the end of the day, it's like an insurance policy. It costs less than 2%. But you have absolutely no vacancies. You get paid on the 10th of every month. And these guys have been operating this since 1998, and there's never been a problem with it. So I know certainly for our investors that are looking to invest offshore, this gives guys tremendous peace of mind knowing that they don't have to worry about their rents and management and maintenance, etc. How do I get a mortgage, and what happens if the interest rates go up? Again, you can get a mortgage from whichever country you're investing in, so whether it's England, Australia, America, from a bank there. It's based on your South African income, and generally the loan to values will be between 50 and 70 percent, sometimes as high as 80 percent, depending on the individual. And what happens if the interest rates go up? I don't think you've got to be a rocket scientist to understand in London, as an example, or England, that, property, that, rent, that interest rates are going to go up. But there are opportunities in those sophisticated markets to also fix mortgages should you, should you want to do that. A fifth one that I get all the time is, I'm, I'm thinking of moving to Australia. Should I buy before I move when, or when I get there? Surely it's easier when I get there. I've had many, many personal experiences. It's far better to buy before you go because you've got an income here. You can prove it to the bank. You can invest in the right property. You can be strategic. And just as an example, there's, and there's not enough time now to go into it, but there's huge tax and depreciation advantages. Um, it's a very tax-friendly country over there. So any shortfall you've got, any depreciation on construction, fixtures and fittings, acquisition costs, even an inspection trip. So you can actually have a property that's cash flow positive, and yet you accumulate a tax loss, and then you can offset that against any income that you've got. Or should you immigrate to Australia at a later stage, you can offset it. You never pay a cent in income tax until you pay that off. Or if you never move to Australia, you can also offset it against capital gains tax. Immigration, I have explained to you. Buying property in particularly these first world countries I've spoken of certainly doesn't guarantee you immigration, but it does facilitate and it does help you in tick boxes. The credit rating, the best way to describe it is my uncle. I told you he moved there in 2003. He bought a house for a million dollars cash and he couldn't get a credit card, car finance or a mobile phone for the first year because he had no credit rating. So it's very important to build up that credit rating. And then lastly, particularly for people that are looking to move, it does help them buy their dream home if they've got investment properties and they have
bought into the market and they understand the market. And the last couple is if it's so good in Australia or in England, as an example, why do people come to South Africa? That is not the case. The case is that from my side, we we understand that people want to invest overseas. So we actually, I went to Australia, I studied the Australian market for over a year, and I found Ozinvest that had been going since 1987. They had outstanding reports. And so I went to them and brought them to South Africa, and it's the same with, with what's happened in, in London. And I'll be honest with you, the one reason I haven't invested in America yet is I haven't found a partner on the ground, a best of breed partner that I, that I trust. There's, a, there's an article here of a number of South Africans that have been buying properties on the Gold Coast. This is about a year old, and unfortunately, as an example, the Gold Coast is one of the worst performing markets in Australia at the moment. And it's just an example of how South Africans get conned into buying the wrong stuff. Um, my brother live, lives in Perth, you know, shouldn't I look there? Again, it's irrelevant where your brother lives, and, uh, you know, Hannes would have taught all of us this, that, again, take emotion out of it, you've got to do the numbers, you've got to understand what you're looking to achieve, you've got to have the right systems, and then when you put them in place, the, that will tell you where the best place is to invest. Why should I do it now? I think we've covered that in a lot of detail. There are lots of companies, how do I choose? The best way to choose is I've, I can give you that market report with the five most important things you need to look for. And go and ask different companies and, and uh, come up with the, the, the one that gives you the comfort to the most important questions. And then lastly, surely it's cheaper if I deal directly with the company or if I buy in Australia. Again, one has to be very careful. People do fix prices, but I do believe with the advent of the Internet and Google, people are becoming a lot more transparent. But just as an example, for us in Australia, you can actually go to jail if you, if you um, change prices and, and it's not the same. So, you know, certainly from our side, when people deal with us, it's the exact same price if, as if you bought in London or if you bought in Australia. And, but that is something that's very important to, to keep in mind, Hannes, because I do know a number of South Africans that bought stuff on the Gold Coast at over 30% of what the current price was in Australia. Yeah, that is always a, a problem. And uh, unfortunately, uh, first of all, normally it's, it's agreed. Uh, people listen to, to other people and to stories, and uh, then they're going to pay the price simply because they haven't done their, their homework. Uh, Scott, I know that we're going to run out of uh, time. We basically already run out of time. Give us a couple of examples quickly. I just, to be honest, I'll just put this not as a sales pitch at all because none of these are available. I just wanted to give some people some examples. So this was a building in Canary Wharf, which is the financial capital. It's called New Providence Wharf. We help people invest in it. And this building was actually finished, I think, in 2003, 2004. And there was a, an investor there that owned 27 units and went bankrupt, and, and these were repossessed properties. So a really nice apartment block on the river right next to Canary Wharf, which is the financial center. This here is, a, is an old period house. This is in an area called Putney. And we've got actually a South African here. He's got a very interesting business. He brings young South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians over. He helps them find jobs, and he puts them up. But the beauty here is that there's a full tenant solution because he rents out the properties on long-term leases for multiple years. So again, it gives, gives the investor that peace of mind. And, and also you get to buy one of those sort of old period English houses. Um, this was a medical center that uh, um, a couple of high net worth individuals from Pretoria and I went over. This was in Bondi Beach in Sydney. We didn't actually end up buying this. We, we were literally at the, at the 11th hour of buying this because it, had a, it was a blue chip tenant with a, with a fantastic yield, and it had a 15-year lease in place, and only under thorough investigation did we find out that it was actually a 5 by 3 which means that it's, it's, it's renewed every five years, but only at the tenant's demand, not at the landlord's demand. And it's just an example, you know, it's not just residential, it is commercial, but one has to be very, very careful, because there is a joke, kind of, um, the easiest way to go from $4 million, sorry, to become a millionaire in Australia is to arrive with $4 million. <laughs> Because most South Africans, you know, literally lo lose a hell of a lot of money because of these foreigners seeing us coming. And then this is this is just an example. Very popular in Australia, we help uh, people invest in three and four bedroom Australian homes, double garage, two living areas. And this is where the Ozinvest guys give their ten year lease back because properties like this, eighty five percent of the Australian population lives in the middle class, and this is exactly what they want to live in and what they want to invest in. So that was actually a property of one of my clients who bought um, in Brisbane. So that, that just gives you an example of the type of things that are available. And then this just gives you its a artistic impression of townhouses. These are becoming more and more popular in Australia because of affordability. And so this is certainly something that, uh, that people are looking at. 
But that, that just hopefully gives people an example of, of the different type of things that are available. Hannes, I just wanted to, I just wanted to finish off and, and, and give a little bit of a parable here. But, you know, it's, it's using nature's laws. And, and birds that fly in a flock save 20% of energy. And I think one of the most important things is that a bird flying in a flock of 25 can fly 70% further than a bird flying on its own. And one of the reasons that most of us lose money when we try and invest overseas, we try and do it on our own. We don't have the experience. We try and use our gut feel. We don't have systems like the ones that you've taught and, and even the property pro system, etc. And if you work with the right partners, you've got the right information, then you can achieve your objectives. And that's all I was trying to show with regards to nature's laws. Yeah, Scott, first of all, I want to thank you because what you've done here, uh, you've made it easy for a lot of us to understand and get a better perspective and a better overview of what to do uh, when we want to invest uh, overseas. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself in IPS. Just very quickly. Uh, so so this, is, this, is, this is now, yeah, this is yep. now a sales speech, eh? so give it your best shot. <laughs> For those of you who don't want the sales pitch, no, look, this is just a bit about our history. At the end of the day, we've helped over 2,000 people invest in international property. It's to a value of over $1.6 billion. We focus on international investment. We're not an estate agency that, that sells property regularly in South Africa and, and suddenly decided it would be good to sell some stuff overseas. We've got best of breed partners with officers and, and guys in South Africa, Australia, the UK, and America. As I said to you with America, it's still something that I'm not as convinced as I am with Australia and the UK. We spend millions every year on research. I travel regularly to these overseas markets to see them, and if anyone wants, I can send you my latest reports. I'm, I'm off to the UK in the next couple of weeks to do my next report there. My best of breed partners is what I'm proudest of. I think with 15 years experience, it's taken a long time to learn how to find the best partners, but, but that's certainly the guys, and, and they're the guys that help me help my clients make the best investments. We've always been very sophisticated in IT and providing efficiency and transparency. I, I pride ourselves with our after-sales team. We actually got some stats recently. 78% of our clients that have invested were happy, gave us 5 out of 5 for our after-sales, and the other 22 gave us 4 out of 5, which I personally think is a fairly phenomenal statistic because they understand how much passion we bring to it and, and helping the person right through the entire process. And then we also bring you know, access to, to opportunities that aren't necessarily available on the markets. And then lastly, just an accolade, I was the first company to join and sign up and be accepted for the AIPP, which is the Association of International Property Professionals. We were the first South African company, and we actually won the award in 2007, 2008 for the best uh, African uh, company, literally as a member of the AIPP. The things we look to deliver, this is our focus. Basically, wealth preservation, transparency, value creation. We, we pride ourselves on being great communicators. We look to bring you returns, peace of mind, a conservative approach. At the end of the day, if you want high-risk investments, stay in South Africa. I know, Hannes, you don't uh, promote that, but for those opportunity seekers out there that look for high-risk, high return, stay in South Africa. Don't try and go overseas. It's, it's, you've got to be conservative if you're looking to go overseas. The risk migration, malema proofing, and, and the plan B. So, you know, that, that really, in a nutshell, Hannes, is where we come from. I think there, there, there doesn't need to be a sales pitch. At the end of the day, we, we pride ourselves in the service that we deliver. And if people are looking to invest offshore, they don't have to necessarily come to us. But at the end of the day, we provide the private banking solution. And if they want to deal with the best, then, then uh, we can provide that service. Hang, uh, thanks, uh, Scott. Uh, you really enlightened us here with a lot of information. Uh, what do people do to get hold of you and where uh, some of the addresses and uh, uh, telephone numbers, please? Just, uh, just in terms of if people were interested in the next step, we've, I've got surveys because I, I like to help them understand exactly what they're looking for. So I get people to fill in a survey. We then set up a meeting so that we can understand what it is they're looking for. At the end of the day, it's very much a case of we understand what they're looking for and then help them provide a solution versus trying to shove a property down their throat. But we then help them buy that property. We help them finance. We help them with the exchange control. We help them manage the entire process with the lawyers, FERB, which is Australia, the developers, the inspections, right through to the management. And for anyone that's, that's interested and thinks that it might not be possible, our Oz Invest partners currently have 40 soldiers in Afghanistan that they're helping. So... You know, we, we, we specialize between us and our partners in remote control. So don't think it's not possible because, you know, it's long distance. 
And then, yeah, really for me, I, I like the saying, take control of your tomorrow. We have the global knowledge, the local solutions, the best of breed partners to provide you with a transparent solution to preserve and create real wealth through international property. And for anyone that's interested, there's all my contact details. You can see our website, IPS Invest. I am having a complete overhaul of this website, um, and it will be, be it's currently in the process of being redone. You've got my email there, you've got our telephone number, and then blog. I always put up all this latest research will be on the blog, or you can email me and I can email it back to you. Twitter, I keep people up to date. Uh, YouTube, Hannes, you know, funny enough, I'm uh, having a bit of a problem with YouTube at the moment. I had 127 videos up there, but they uh, they seem to have lost them, but I'll, I'll get that restored, and then our Facebook page. But really, that's uh, that's all from my side. I see there's a couple of questions that have come through here, Hannes. So what I suggest is I'll leave up the, the, the contact page, and if you don't mind, I can just go through these questions quickly. Yeah, please go through it. Uh, just uh, one thing, your Facebook address, uh, IPS uh, uh, Space Invest. Uh, Sorry. Uh, otherwise, they, they won't be able to, to find you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I quickly check, checked it out. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, uh, should, go, go for the questions, uh, Scott. Is this measurement? Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to look here. Okay, Bertie's asked, uh, can you explain uh, what is compounded growth? Bertie, can, can I suggest for the purpose of tonight, can we, um, we're going to overlay that to next week's webinar for the Wealth Creators University students. Are you happy with that, Hannes? Yeah, perfect. Um, because it's, uh, it's not 100% pertinent to tonight, and, and we will do that. So, Bertie, if you don't mind, we'll do that next week. I am just conscious of time. Makiel's asked, Julius is talking about land. Does this mean sectional title as well? Makiel, at the moment, uh, from what I can understand, he is primarily talking about land and not necessarily residential property. Um, but again, uh, whether it's all hot smoke or whatever, it, I'm, I'm just making you aware of what I've been able to find in terms of where we're at. But certainly worth more research if I was you. Brendan says, what is the limit in the amount of money we can invest offshore? Brendan, it's 4 million rand per person per year. So you and your wife can move up to 8 million rand if you've got children over the age of 18. It's another 4 million rand per person with them. And if you've got a business, you can actually move up to 500 million rand. Uh, Johannes says, it will be interesting to hear from Hannes how you can make your RAND work for you. Topic for another webinar. Again, if we can bring that up at next week's webinar, I'll bring up these questions next week if that's okay. Johannes and Hannes. Perfect. Marcus said, uh, no, sorry, he said he's just joined. Uh, Brendan, uh, okay, Brendan's asked for the reports. Brendan, if you can just send me an email just to remind me, anyone that wants to reports, email me and I'll send you all the market reports. I did all this research. I know where to look, and but it always takes me about half a day to put everything together just, just so that I was up to date. Justino said, what about Portugal? Not only because I'm Portuguese, but what is happening there right now? Justino, it's a good question. And off the top of my head, I, I don't want to sit and, and, uh, and give you sort of, I am concerned, obviously, about the Portuguese economy. I know that the Portuguese property market has been affected in a very similar way to Spain. What happened is that a very quick overview is that they gave very cheap financing, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italians, um, the Turks, not the Turks, sorry, the Greeks, were all used to borrowing, like we South Africans, between sort of 12 and 15 percent. Then they joined the ECB and what, sorry, and uh, the, sorry, the EU, and because of the German banks, funding immediately became available at like 2 percent. And you can imagine, I mean, just imagine what would happen in South Africa if the interest rate would drop from 12 percent to 2 percent. And that's basically what has taken out Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Greece, and Italy, which have been known as the pigs, because they just had a complete overextension on spending and credit, and that had a huge impact on their property market. So again, one has to be very careful and, and understand what is happening in those economies. Matsetsi said, thank God Property Pro software was invented. With all other emotions involved in the purchasing, the software leads to fruitful results when followed. Thank you, Dr. Dreyer. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one, Hannes. My pleasure. That, 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 that's great. Thanks, Matiti. <laughs> Makiel says, uh, U.S. sovereign debt equals Julius factor of America. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't exactly know what you mean by that, but look at anything. There's lots of uh, factors to take into account. Robert Kuzel has said, what video camera do you use for your videos as per last webinar? Um, Robert, that's a whole other web webinar put together. Um, I don't actually, well, I've got lots of video cameras. Uh, well, I've got three, to be honest. And um, yeah, 
Uh, I use a Sony one for my outdoor ones. I use my iPhone when I'm just recording and videoing, and then I use my webcam when I'm doing webinars. Uh, Mark said, when can I buy one, oh, why can, why can one buy only new developments in Australia? It's because of FERB, Mark. It's Foreign Investment Review Board. It's a law. You're only allowed to buy as a foreigner new development. So you can only buy new land, a new house, or a new apartment. You can't buy existing property. Their logic, and I think it's quite sound, is that in the 80s there was a lot of investment from the east, and they decided, well, the best way to prop up and maintain the Australian construction industry which is a massive part of GDP, it is in any country, it's the same in our country, was to make sure that foreigners were buying new properties. And uh, look, the one thing is, is that in South Africa we don't have that type of legislation, but at least in Australia it's clear, and because of that they don't have any uncertainty, which we, we've got a tremendous amount of uncertainty because we keep make, changing our mind as to whether foreigners should be allowed to invest or not. So that, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, Kevin Deeb said, thanks for the talk, Scott and Hannes. Who is your best of breed partner in the UK? Kevin, if you can get hold of me and let me know what you're looking for, then I can let you know because it, it depends on what you're looking for. We've got various uh, best of breeds in different sectors, different areas, uh, and it depends on what you're looking for. Bertie says, uh, no problem. Brendan says, thanks. And Justina says, thanks, guys, for a very informative Tuesday night. Tuesday nights are just not the same anymore. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. If there's no other questions, anything from your side, Hannes, anything that I didn't answer, I am aware and I do apologize that I've taken so long, but it is very difficult to analyze the offshore market, three different countries, and answer questions all in a, a short space of time. I think what we can do, uh, Scott, is uh, in the Wealth Creators University, uh, one of the next, uh, if they've got any questions, to send it through, and uh, between the students, we'll, we'll handle most of the, of the questions. But I haven't got anything. Uh, I can compliment you on what you've done. I think you've done great. Uh, you've done a, a, a lot of research, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we really enjoyed it. I know it's a little bit over time, but it was absolutely, absolutely worthwhile. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Cool, guys. Well, thanks very much, Hannes. Thanks to everyone who's been online tonight. As you can hear, I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff, so if, there's, if I can be a more assistant, let me know. And as always, I firmly believe in South Africa. I think it's a fantastic opportunity, but I also like to look beyond the borders and see what else and other opportunities are available. So thanks, everyone, guys. Have a great evening, and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Good night, everyone.